two. One second. Here. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to a weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigella, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Deputy Chief of Public Health Services, as well as Dr. Earl Potter, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. We have two additional guests today, Christine Holm, Chief of Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness, as well as Carney Hall, CEO of Interfaith Works. Yes, Interfaith Works. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Mr. County Executive, good afternoon. How are you? Can you please unmute? <laughs> I thought it was fine and it's just a little bit warm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I've been dealing without air conditioning now for four weeks, waiting for an air conditioner part. So there's nothing like having a house at about 90 degrees at bedtime. It's delightful. <laughs> Um, but anyway, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, every day since the 4th of July, Montgomery County has been under an extreme heat alert. For at least five hours and up to nine hours some days, we've been asking people to be careful because of our heat indices, and they have consistently soared past 94 degree, 95 degrees over the last week, and sometimes it's felt as high as 105 degrees or more. The heat on Tuesday prompted an excessive heat warning from the National Weather Service, the county also elevated its warning to a heat emergency alert. When temperatures are this dangerous, we bring together our departments to determine what actions we can take in order to provide some people some relief and to keep them safe. Um, I encourage everyone in need of relief from the heat to use our library, senior centers, and rec centers. They can provide a cool break from the punishing heat. The centers are open during regular operating hours, and it's good to remind everyone that outdoor pools may reach capacity as more people try to escape the heat, so plan accordingly. HHS's Aging and Disability Services has a limited number of free desktop fans for the county's older adults and individuals with disabilities and residents in need. And if you're interested, you can call Aging and Disability Resources Unit at 240-777-3000 to make arrangements to pick up free fans in Rockville. And I want to remind anyone who has been out during the heat during the day to drink plenty of water, limit the time you spend outside, never leave kids or pets in cars because vehicles can heat up extremely quickly. Uh, in the midst of these sweltering conditions, uh, We've paid a lot of attention to places like nursing homes and assisted living facilities, and we ensure that they have power and are equipped to handle the heat. Our service provider partners, like those that operate shelters and respite for people lacking a safe place to be out of the heat, um, are just not always prepared, but are ready to extend our hours when necessary and provide additional resources in the name of safety and comfort. We're pushing things as far as we can push them to make sure we can get people out of the heat. I wanna highlight a good story that came out of a bad situation. On July 4th, an electrical fire sparked at a women's shelter in Derwent. No one was injured in the fire, but about three dozen clients and 16 staff were displaced. Despite the holiday, members of our Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management coordinated with our Health and Human Services team to find a temporary shelter quickly. I also want to commend Montgomery County Fire and Rescue crews and staff members within Interfaith Works, which manages the shelter, along with the American Red Cross and the Maryland Medical Reserve Corps and the Department of Transportation, all of whom came together on Independence Day to prepare a safe and welcoming place for the women to be sheltered in after the fire. They all gave up their holiday and worked quickly to help these women handle this disruption. Because the electrical fire unfortunately damaged the ceiling the shelter could be unusable for up to two months, possibly longer. We will share information about how the public can help these women momentarily. But first, I want to welcome Christine Hong to this week's media briefing. She leads our services to end and prevent homelessness. We're also joined by the CEO of Interfaith Works, Courtney Hall. And I want to thank you both for joining me today. And Christine, let's begin with you. Thank you so much, Mr. County Executive. I just wanted to talk a little bit about 
when there are extreme temperatures like we're experiencing now, the efforts that services to end and prevent homelessness and our community partners make to keep everyone safe, including those who are unhoused and unsheltered. We have an extraordinary group of outreach partners who are currently canvassing the streets of Montgomery County for those who are unsheltered and may need to come in out from out of the heat and they're distributing water. They're encouraging those individuals to come inside. And I can also uh, acknowledge Interfaith Works. They have opened their um, drop-in center at Progress Place in downtown Silver Spring as a cooling center. Whenever we have been experiencing extreme heat, they have extended their hours to match the time of the extreme heat advisory or alert. In addition to that, both Interfaith Works and the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless have expanded their shelter so that individuals who need shelter at night when it has continued to remain very warm and uncomfortable and unhealthy for individuals, they have expanded their space. And I also want to acknowledge Shepherd's Table for offering space at Progress Place so that more people could stay there overnight if needed. The capacity at Progress Place has expanded um, to serve about 130 individuals total. That's during the day and also at night. That includes year-round beds, um, as well as seasonal extreme temperature beds and then the space at Shepherd's Table. So it's really quite an extraordinary effort. And I just want to continue to thank all of those in the community who express their concern for those who are unsheltered and for the hard work that our partners are doing and for our staff at Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. Mr. Hall, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Courtney Hall, CEO for Interfaith Works, and we are, as has been mentioned already by the county executive, the nonprofit that operates the shelter at Krebs Branch Way. As has already been mentioned, there was a fire July 4th, midday. Everyone is safe. And all of the residents have been relocated to a, a county building in Rockville. Really want to express thanks to the county uh, and also to the Red Cross, who have been fantastic partners through this process. This has been a traumatic process already. If you can imagine those who are experiencing homelessness, there's already a level of trauma. And then to have that disrupted further but I'm happy to report that all of the women have been settled. They are all settled in their new space. We have also received a significant outpouring from the community who put out a few calls for hot, ready to eat meals. And uh, we have received a significant amount of support already. Because we expect to be there for two months, at least, we are hoping to fill up meals all the way through September. So we're particularly looking for individuals who are either willing to prepare a meal or to purchase a meal from a restaurant. And we're also looking for restaurants who would be willing to donate or sponsor a meal. We do not have kitchen facilities at this temporary site. So having hot ready to eat meals is going to be key. For those who are unable to provide or purchase a meal, we would encourage you to go to our website iworksmc.org, and you, uh, we would welcome your donation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Members of the media, uh, any questions at this time for uh, Mr. Hall or Ms. Hall or the county executive regarding this particular topic? Please raise your hand if you have any questions regarding homelessness and the extreme heat. No questions about this topic? Okay, Mr. County Executive, uh, Mr. Hall, Ms. Hong, thank you for joining us. You can remain on the call or you can depart if you need to go. Oh, Christian Pena, Pena. Christian, good afternoon. Who, oh, who, who are you with? Which is your I organization? Am, I am with DC News Now. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead. My apologies. I thought the questions were only directed to the homelessness um, issue, but did want to talk about the heat very briefly. Um, if the county executive could respond to that, would be greatly appreciated or anyone in regarding to this issue. But um, 
as you're probably all aware, um, you know, the county is doing several things in order to ensure the safety of individuals in the county uh, regarding heat measures. Um, if you could just recap the importance of these initiatives, what they are, and should we continue to be on the lookout for them, as many people who I've spoken to throughout the day are telling me these resources are greatly appreciated and much needed to combat the heat. Um, Earl, do you want to go into detail? I mean, basically, it's our libraries, you know, any of our public facilities that are open, uh, people are allowed to go in and just cool down. Uh, and we've got, you know, fans available for people to pick up. But I think there's some more things that uh, that are happening as well. Yeah, so it's a it's a concerted effort across county government. Uh, libraries, rec centers, regional service centers are typical locations. We have a very robust network in Montgomery County of facilities that have been invested in over decades that allow us to direct people to those public facilities, which are all air conditioned. Uh, there you'll there you'll find bottled water and other resources where you can just sit, cool down, relax. Uh, ride on buses also. If you just need to, if you need a mobile spot to cool down, you're out and about. You see a ride on bus, you're allowed to hop on a ride on bus and just cool down. Um, uh, we typically have, we've been working to put water on those over the last several days. And so most, most, if not all buses should have water at this point, uh, that is available freely to the public who, for those who need it, uh, uh, Ms. Hong already alluded to, we focus on our vulnerable populations. So we have teams out working to find and identify homeless individuals who may be out and about who we try and get them into the shelter during these particular periods of extreme heat. Our police department is also made aware. So if they see anybody on the street, they can either themselves, uh, help transport them to the shelter or uh, notify Health and Human Services to have them do outreach to that individual as well. Um, we we talk to our nursing homes, the assisting facilities, make sure we're, we're more constantly monitoring their power and make sure that they have a sustainable power input to make sure that uh, they're all fully functional because we know that uh, those vulnerable populations during extreme heat are, are, are significant. Um, and then obviously we're working with our utilities to make sure that if there are any brownouts or anything of that nature that we're made aware in apartment buildings, condos, or anywhere else, because we know that, uh, you know, uh, people in high rises can be a particular risk because of the temperature rises. And so we're monitoring all those things. Uh, our Office of Emergency Management and Security coordinates with, with a number of other agencies. We do a call in advance of these events, make sure that we know what, what buildings have power, what buildings don't, and make sure we provide the best accurate information that we can during these events. And then everything else is public messaging. So we rely on you, you know, our partners within the media to make sure that the public knows what the resources are out there, but also what the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion and heat stroke are. Um, nausea, uh, ex excessive sweating, uh, lightheadedness. If you see any of those signs or symptoms, we tell people get indoors, get, get hydrated as quickly as you can. And we also remind workers, you know, through our Department of Permanent Services out to work sites that, hey, you have a responsibility to make sure that your workers are, are protected as well. And so that's sort of a um, an overview of many of the activities we do during these extreme heat days. Thank you. And should we continue to expect these sort of initiatives as the county faces more heat days in the near future throughout the summer? Yeah, so we have a, our, we, our county has had an extreme temperature plan that covers both heat and cold uh, and it has two levels of alerts. We're in the highest level of alert, which is when at when we reach 105 heat index, uh, which we've reached the last two days. Uh, the lower level is at 95 degree heat, heat index. And, we, and so we basically send out notices when, whenever we reach those and we take the actions that are associated with those trigger levels whenever we reach those trigger levels. So when we get to 105, we do the highest level of response and that's exactly what you're seeing right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question members uh, of the media, any other questions uh, regardless, uh, regarding homelessness and, and the heat? Okay. <clears throat> okay. There you go, Mr. Executive. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, just, just a reminder, if, if you encounter anybody who's unhoused or showing symptoms of heat exhaustion or stroke, weakness, confusion, dizziness, loss of consciousness, please call 911. Uh, they're in need of shelter and uh, we can help. And we have also our homeless information line 240-907-2688. Many people have asked how else they can help in a situation like this. The easiest way is to make a financial do donation to Interfaith Works. The immediate need though is for hot meals because there's not a working kitchen at the temporary sh shelter. So anybody who feels like cooking a little bit extra or one of the restaurants who might be paying attention. If you can help out, we could definitely use support getting meals to these families. 
anybody who's interested in providing a meal or delivering meals that are donated by restaurants, you can call 240-468-6386 or share the link that we've shared in the chat and get that information, get that information and help us if you can. Um, other notes, I'm pleased this week to welcome Corey Smedley to lead the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service as the next chief. Once he's sworn in next week, he'll be MCFRS's first black chief. Corey began his career as a firefighter in Prince George's County. Um, and a, he was a firefighter and a paramedic before taking on special roles like being the lead public safety official at Commander's Games in Landover. In 2019, he became the chief fire chief in Alexandria. And this past January, he returned to Prince George's County Fire and Emergency Management Systems before accepting the role of chief here. I want to thank the county executive for confirming, the county council, I mean, for concern, confirming his nomination on Tuesday. Very confident that Corey's wealth of experience, dedication to public safety will greatly benefit our community. And I look forward to working together with him. His breadth of experience is really important here. He met all of the key things we were looking for. Someone who's worked in a union environment, someone who's looked in a combined service where you have both uh, professional and volunteer firefighters, someone who's worked in a large system and someone who's been involved in, in public safety systems now that we see the trend changing from, you know, primarily being a fire station to being more and more um, providing medical assistance to people in the community. So as the FRS service um, changes, uh, we're going to have a leader who's prepared to take us through those changes. So I'm excited about this. Um, we also have an update on a topic that many people are concerned about in the last month, large house parties that have gotten the attention of the state lawmakers, neighbors, and public safety leaders in Montgomery County. I'm happy to share that through our efforts, we have thwarted a couple of these events but just over the last week. We know that our efforts forced the organizers to relocate the planned parties out of Montgomery County. And we were able to advise the county where they were going, what they were gonna be looking at. We've identified some of the houses that have been used for multiple parties and are working across departments to respond quickly to any illegal activities that occurs during these parties. That includes, but not limited to noise violations, capacity issues, parking hazards, and alcohol laws. laws. We know these parties are skirting the law by charging for things like alcohol and food without drawing the proper permits. These safeguards are in place to ensure people's safety. And without those permits, these parties could become dangerous to party goers and people living nearby. So we have teams that are ready to respond if parties occur that are not on our radar. And if they pop up, we're ready to mobilize a team to go deal with it. It's important to understand that most of the violations created by parties like these are civil infractions. They may warrant a ticket, but not an arrest. Uh, if, a, if it's not a police officer's job to break up parties, if there's no criminal activity or um, witnessed or observed, then those tickets will get their day in court and repeat tickets will lead to crim criminal charges. We are taking this seriously. Um, you know, there's a bill that could legalize this. I am not in support of any bill that legalizes this. This is not fair to neighbors, not fair to communities, not fair to people trying to drive down a road and expect normal safe conditions. Uh, and it would put an enormous burden on our department to have to police these events if anybody was allowed to do them. So uh, I'm not gonna be supporting legislation that would try to normalize this at all. Um, before opening it up to questions, I'd like to offer my health team and other county leaders a chance to provide any updates they have. Then we'll come back for questions. Mr. O'Donnell, Dr. Stoddard, any updates? We're good for my part. I don't know if Sean has any. No, just uh, we're just reiterating um, precautions as we see our summer bump of, of COVID cases occurring. And, um, you know, it, it is not resulting to date in significant increases in hospitalizations, but we have seen those numbers go up across the state and across the country. So, again, just uh, words of caution to those who are at, are at higher risk for severe illness. 
Okay, we're going to open it up for uh, questions again, members of the media, any general questions or more heat related questions. Please raise your hand. Okay, Jeannie Bixby, Moco 360, good afternoon. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Lorna. Um, hi, Mark. I know sure. that to kind of jump back to when we were talking about the budget, um, I know that one of your critiques of some of the changes that the county council made was cuts to some of the food resiliency programming. Could you talk about some of the struggles that the county is facing right now with food resiliency and kind of what, where we're going from here? Well, I mean, we're kind of in the same situation we were in last year. Um, the council, you know, cut the funding in half and said, come back later if you need it. And that process, you know, can be very disruptive because not every group that we fund starts running out of money at the exact same time. So it wasn't like, you know, we we were just one one and done. And it shows up differently in different groups, depending on how many people they serve. And we were concerned last year that we had seen, and particularly our providers, had seen no downtick in the number of people who were needing food. And that's not altogether um, surprising, you know, when you have homelessness on the rise, uh, when you have rents on the heavy rise, uh, there's no reason to think that the need has suddenly suddenly gotten less. And it proved during the year that their providers either gave as much or more as they gave in the previous year. And uh, they were anticipating that nothing has changed at the point we were doing the budget. There, none of them felt that they were looking at a downward trend for the coming year. Uh, so we will no doubt be back to the council to ask for the money as we start to run out again. It is our policy that people do not go hungry. Uh, it's our policy, you know, councils made a lot out of this, no child goes hungry. If we don't have enough food in these programs, children will go hungry. So we're gonna make sure that as we see signs of warning come up, we will make the appropriate request for additional funds. Can I add one thing here? Cause um, it, food falls, uh, it's one of the areas that I have in my portfolio for the county executive. And one thing that I was, think was particularly frustrating was the was the uh, removal of the SNAP benefit and the SNAP education. And mm -hmm. the reason why this is important is because, so SNAP education is actually matched at the state level. So dollar for dollar, for every dollar the county invests, the state will match it. Meaning that you'd get twice the benefit from the investment of the county dollars. And what those dollars go to is getting people who are eligible for SNAP, who don't realize they're eligible for SNAP, enrolled in SNAP, which opens up doors for access to additional federal resources. And so the magnification on the county dollars is twofold for the education. And then every dollar that you bring in from the state is the dollar that you don't have to spend at the county level to feed the same people who are eligible for these programs. And so this, you know, is sort of, you know, if we're talking about doing more with less money, it was a perfect example of a program that could have done a lot more with limited dollars um, and, and, and open up a pool of federal dollars that we, we, we know these residents are eligible for. We just have to do the outreach and education and help walk them through a, what can be a, a complicated pro process for an individual to undertake, but the county can help them do it. And so we were, um, we were a bit disappointed that, you know, one of those items didn't get funded as well. Thanks. I'll just say that, you know, it would have been nice to have public discussion about that. Because as far as the public knows, and as far as the nonprofits knew, every single thing that wound up getting cuts, I had nine, I think it was nine pages of cuts, over 120 items. Every single thing was passed on a committee vote of either three nothing or two to one. I think there was only one two to one vote. So these were all things that groups thought the council had approved of and was going to the um, to the council as a whole, the council as a whole put everything on a reconciliation list. And then the council through their aides met in privately and made cuts to the list. And you know what I hear from the community is a real aggravation over not understanding why council members made cuts, um, no discussion, no warning about it. Our staff was not invited to come to those meetings and explain why some of these programs are important and you might not want to cut them. So it's frustrating on our end, but it's you know certainly frustrating in the world of providers who do a lot of this work. Um, and we're glad they do it because frankly, they do it for less because they're nonprofits and they're able to deliver some of these services for less than the government would. And I think one of the most you know grievous things to people was money for people who would have uh, been able to get us federal reimbursement 
they would have brought in more money than it costs to hire them. And uh, we couldn't even get money for that. And that's, you know, I think it's short-sighted. And we're going to ask, you know, over the next year that the council not do this process again this way. Um, people should, if you don't want to vote for something, people should see you're not voting for it. People know what I'd support and what I don't support. Everybody should be able to see what people support and they don't support. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Members of the media, any other questions this afternoon? Please raise your hand. No more questions today? Going once, going twice. I guess we're done. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all.